Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 17, 2018, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys for coming today and girls. I know today wasn't too easy to get in, so I appreciate you being patient and toughing it out. So thank you so much. All right, what are we talk about? Well, obviously, we're going to talk about current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, keep the questions related to the slides while we're on the slides. And that's just to keep me focused because my ADD will kick in and I do tend to go off on rants, which some people like and some people aren't as big a fan of. And then when we get to the charts, ask about your favorite stock picks and feel free to ask about any other questions that you may have or towards the end of the show. And I'll open it up for stock picks. When you do ask about a stock, just put the ticker in, hit return. And if you want to ask about another stock, put the ticker in, hit return. That way I can tell, and this is for your benefit, what stocks I've covered and which ones that I haven't. So this week, I want to talk about the psychology of technical analysis and you. Before we do that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or... As I often say, all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That comes from Greg Morris. So let's talk about the psychology of technical analysis and you. Everyone, as I often say, is mostly focused on the methodology. And I often question myself, am I spending too much time talking about psychology and this is especially true lately when I've been doing a lot of work on the learning management system and putting all these courses together and my answer is no the everyone's excited about the methodology and money management and psychology become second fiddle the reality is get your psychology right and then the money management down and then the methodology will tend to fall into place. The other thing, too, is the methodology is somewhat mechanical. If I show you a good-looking setup and say, look, this stock is in a persistent trend. The trend's accelerating. We have this TKO pattern, the trend knockout, which we will touch upon in one second. The sector's trending. The market's trending. All the pieces fit together. Well, that's fairly mechanical. I have friends who are mechanical traders, and I think they're a little bit more discretionary than they lead on because they don't necessarily follow everything exactly mechanical. And those same people think I'm a lot more mechanical, even though I claim to be a discretionary trader because of the way I follow things. So somewhere there's a bit of a middle ground in there, but the bottom line is I will admit that it's fairly Mechanical, you might spend a lot of time looking at a lot of different stocks and use a little discretion in your analysis, but by the time you actually find a decent looking setup, if any, of course, if conditions don't warrant taking the setup, then obviously you don't take a setup. But by the time you do find a setup, or if you do find a setup, then that's all fairly mechanical. Now, I wouldn't want to reduce it down to strictly mechanical where you want to have the computer recognize everything and that's why I'm a discretionary trader. I want to see the actual pattern and that's why I use loose parameter scans. But the bottom line is it is again, not to be dead horse, fairly mechanical and fairly easy, believe it or not. It's the psychology that's the hard part. Now my definition of technical analysis is Reading the emotions of the market participants while at the same time embracing your own. And that's the hard part, embracing your own. The reason that technical analysis works, and I'm not talking about some kind of mumbo jumbo, arcane counting system. I'm talking about good old fashioned chart reading with the occasional moving average as an indicator. But for the most part, starting with the blank chart and leaving it mostly blank, and then maybe again, putting in that occasional moving average. So if we're looking at something like a trend knockout, 
because this is probably the easiest one to show you when it comes to psychology of market. Trend knockout is simply a strong trend followed by a sharp sell-off within that sharp trend. And what that does is it shakes out the Johnny come latelys. And we've discussed this slide quite a bit, so I'll go through it fairly quickly. But the Johnny come latelys tend to be the absolute worst traders. If you're actually in this trend prior to when these Johnny come latelys hurry up and just pile in at the last minute, a lot of times what will happen is if the market begins to sell off a little bit, they get shaken out really quick. In other words, knocked out. Okay, and that's the why I call it a trend knockout or a technical knockout. So they get knocked out, and that clears the way for you to get on board. These are the absolute worst traders, these Johnny Come Latelys. They tend to buy at whatever price. They tend to be skittish. They have little staying power, either mentally or monetarily. And as I said a second ago, if you're already in the trend, they tend to dump their positions quickly and take you out with them. But if you wait until they've been knocked out through that obvious sell off, then there's a good chance you can get in if that market begins to rally. Because if it does, they're going to have to put up a shut up and sometimes they'll come pile right back in and that could actually lead to a parabolic stock move. Now that in combination with the shorts. So shorts tend to have more of an ego. In fact, I didn't know this until a few years ago. I was speaking in Vegas to a bunch of day traders. They actually short the parabolics. So they're jumping in front of a moving train expecting that train to stop and reverse. Not the greatest strategy in the world, unless, of course, you were using some sort of trigger pattern and not just piling in to a market that's going straight up. And when that market begins to sell off, they feel pretty good pretty fast. Unfortunately, if that market begins to rally, they're going to be forced back in. They're going to be forced to buy. Because what happens is they begin losing money on the trade. Now, their ego might not let them buy back in because their strategy, again, was to do what? Sell the market when it's high. Well, now the market's even higher. So if you're following that strategy, what should you do? Well, you should sell more. You should short more. But eventually what could happen is that they get squeezed out. And eventually they will get squeezed out if that market continues to rally. And that will help to exacerbate the price rise. Now, there's not enough time to cover all of the psychology of a market in one session, but what I want to do here is just give you a sampling of what happens. This is a pretty cool little setup we had a while back. Unfortunately, we had quite a bit of overhead supply. Now, remember, these are not little bars in and of themselves. There are people behind these bars. So people will have likely bought during this range, thinking that, hey, the market's kind of low. It was way up here. Now it's kind of low. So maybe this is worth buying. Now, the majority of people are bad traders. That's a good thing. That's a good thing for us. So what do they do? Well, when this market begins to drop, more than likely, they don't just automatically exit. Now, there's some reasons they might be forced to exit. They might be forced to exit, as we'll see in one second, for monetary reasons. But let's suppose they're not forced out for monetary reasons because they need the money. Let's just say they have enough money in the trading account to stick with the position. They're likely to hold on to try to get back to break even. So let's say you take a position here, even though this is a great looking little setup, a bow tie, which is not shown, double bottom, cup and handle, first thrust. Boy, everything is just lining up greatly. And it's a, I guess, I think this is a Chinese stock. So Chinese stocks were hot a while back when, when I found this setup. Unfortunately, anybody who bought in this range might be looking to get out of break even, which is not a winning strategy trying to play for break even especially because this can happen 
obviously in between. But it's just human nature. Dave, is a TKO in the slide presentation validated because the market comes back at the end of day, not far from the open, i.e. it forms a long hammer candle? No, not necessarily. If you watch some of these other presentations that I've done, you'll see where I show a TKO that closes poorly. Like sometimes you have a TKO down here, and these can be traded in more of a textbook fashion. If you, I'll help you find it on my website. There's a video on TKOs where we talk about poor closes. So no, it's not necessarily a, a good close versus a bad close. Although a poor close one, you could trade more mechanical like entry right here, stop right here. One that closes up here, you want to give it a little bit of wiggle room. One that closes poorly, if the market comes all the way back up here, then the chances are that you have a bona fide reversal. The other thing about one that closes poorly from a good standpoint is, although you won't make any money, the next day it might just gap lower and keep on dropping and no capital is put into harm's way. And one of the secrets of trading it took me many years to learn is to avoid as many bad trades as possible. Now, Tom McClellan once said that would you place a trade, you're forming a relationship, of course, if it's an equity, with the company. And you expect the company to do good things. You expect the company to enhance shareholder value. That's the bottom line of every company. It should be the bottom line of every company is to enhance shareholder value. But Tom went on to say, that you're also forming a relationship with every person who has bought that stock prior to you and those people will screw you. So I told Tom, I said, Tom, that presentation you did a couple years back in New Orleans for the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts, I really like what you said. He goes, well, I'll do you one better. My mom, Marion, my late mother, Marion, used to say that people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money. And others use far more sophisticated methods. So when you're looking at a market, just realize that people buy and sell for a lot of reasons. Let's say we're in a bear market and the market keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. Well, let's say you're getting ready to retire and you're looking at your retirement account and let's say you have a million dollars in your retirement account and then all of a sudden you got 900,000, 800,000, 700,000. Well, pretty soon your lifestyle is going to change drastically from where it was to where it is and eventually you may be forced out. Another example would be kids going to college. My youngest is going to college in two months. Well, that's going to cost me a chunk of change. I might have to sell some stocks to pay for it, okay? So people buy and sell for a variety of reasons. Now, this is a presentation I did a while back. I also wrote a column on this. A lot of times I'll show people a chart, and I'll draw an arrow on it, and it says, well, that's in hindsight. Well, this was from a friend of mine who talked about that he bought a company because he liked the company. And that was somewhere around here. That was somewhere around here. And then he bought some because he thought it was low and then he bought it on the way down. And he bought because he thought it was cheap, he was gonna flip it out of break even. So when we're looking at this chart and I drew this big arrow, he's like, well, that's in hindsight. He's like, well, wait a minute. You bought here, and you bought here, and you bought here, and then you bought recently here. Well, let's connect the lines, okay? Connect the arrows, whatever. Obviously, that stock was in a downtrend. So remember that you're dealing with the emotions of an emotional being, which is made up of a lot of emotional beings. Let me rewind that. You're dealing with an emotional being made up of a lot of emotional beings, and one of which is you, by the way. 
So the secret is to read the mind of the market, the psychology of the market, while at the same time embracing your own. Now, as I say, ad nauseum, the reason I say, reason I say embracing your own psychology, embracing your emotions is because you can't control your emotions. You're going to have emotions. If you got out of bed this morning, you had emotions. If you had a day without emotions, you would die. We need emotions for everything that we do. Every decision must has a, have a consequence. Every decision must have a consequence. Otherwise, you cannot make a decision. It's been proven from people who have had illnesses or some sort of injury. And that's the work of Damasio, Descartes era, and Denise Scholl, who does some trading psychology work. So my way to wrap my head around that, everything in life I often equate back to trading. I'm obsessed with trading. It has consumed me. It has become my life. It's in me. So everything that I do, I find myself relating it back to trading. And one of the best things that I have done is to become cognizant of my own feelings in life and in trading. And that helped me to wrap my head around the emotional nature of the market. Being cognizant of your feelings in life makes you realize how damn emotional you are. So two minutes before I started this presentation, I had an account error, which locked me out of my account, which would have made my account cost five times more because I'm grandfathered in. So I became very emotional. I'm glad the mic was off. I'm glad the presentation was shut down because my credit card had expired two days ago. Even though I updated it, as soon as it expired, they kicked me out of the system. So I wrapped my head around that saying, okay, you're an emotional guy, Dave. Then do the same thing in your trading. Once you embrace how emotional you are in life, it gets a little bit easier to trade because you'll recognize those emotions in your trading. So being cognizant of your own feelings and trading in life in general will help you to wrap your head around the emotional nature of the market. One thing that I'd forgotten and when I was speaking at that aforementioned conference a couple of years ago, somebody pointed out that you're trading traders and not markets. And that's something that's very hard for someone new to trading to wrap their head around. They think there has to be some sort of logic involved. There's a reason why it's doing this or doing that, or there's a reason why it should go higher, or there's a reason why it's too high. Neighbor came over a few days ago and he goes, I'm shorting all because it's high. I'm like, why would you do that? Because it's high. It's too high. It's like, well, okay. Other traders don't seem to think so. The big blue arrow is pointing higher. Now, the reason technical analysis works is because market participants often behave in an irrational manner. Yogi Berra once said, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. Well, if you substitute the word world and put in the word market, then Yogi's 100% correct. If everyone agreed upon price, then price would be what it is. It wouldn't go up or down. It's the disagreement, the disequilibrium of price, which allows us to profit. So remember, if the market weren't perfect, it wouldn't be. If the market, let me rewind that. If the market were perfect, it wouldn't be. Now, trading is a game of introspection. 
And one of the hard things is it's sort of like the heavy is the head that wears a crown. You have no higher authority to report to if you're a private trader, of course, if you work for a firm, big difference. But if you're a private trader, you have no higher authority to report to. You only have yourself. And sometimes that's not easy. So introspection, I found this definition I thought was pretty good. A reflective looking inward, an examination of one's own thoughts and feelings. As we'll see in one second, I'm going to beat the dead horse one more time. I can't promise that I'll quit, but probably won't. But in Market Wizards, one of the guys pointed out you have to recognize the difference between intuition and into wishing. And that comes with that introspection. And I'm going to give you a checklist here in a minute of things to think about when you're doing that introspection. Robert Rotella wrote Elements of a Successful Trader. I'm looking at it right now. As I said before, I don't really remember what's in the first three quarters of the book. I know he talked about technical analysis and such. But in the, last, in the last section of the book, he talked about trading psychology. And it really hit home with me, maybe because I was going through a rough time. And let's face it, as traders, you're nearly always going through a rough time. I know it sounds negative, but if you embrace that, it's easier to live with. It never gets easy, but it does get easier. Anyway, Rotella, in the last section of that book, wrote about psychology. And I really liked that book and maybe because it's it's what I needed at the right time I would later find out that Rotella was going through his own big drawdown and having a lot of difficulties in trading when he wrote that so it's possible and likely that was very heartfelt it looks like Mr. Rotella is doing quite well now so he was able to climb out that hole for uh, both emotionally and psychologically God give me strength to face a fact, even though it may slay me. As I often say, don't confuse the issue with facts. Unless you're Bubba Clinton, what is, is. The price of a stock, the ask, is the lowest amount that somebody will sell you that stock. Someone will sell you that stock. The value of the stock, the bid, is whatever someone will pay you for it. So what is is goes a long ways in the markets. Don't justify, don't confuse the issue with facts. Don't interject fundamentals. I know I just said the F word. What is is? Would you make a trade? And this is another one of those little gems I picked up from the American Association of Prof Professional Technical Analysts. I joined the organization thinking there'd be a whole lot of gee whiz stuff, but it, was, it turned out to be a lot more simple little things that just make a whole lot of sense. When you make a trade, you're not agreeing on anything other than price. And think about that and think about how important that is. Leo Melamed said, one of the favorite things he's ever said was, be a lover, not a fighter when it comes to trend. And he was head of the Chicago Merck, I think, for a long time. If you learn how to understand yourself, you've got an edge on everyone else. Sun Tzu quotes come to mind. I, I hate people that quote Sun Tzu, often at least, but there's a lot of good wisdom in the art of war. And paraphrasing, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear a thousand battles or a hundred battles. If you know your enemy, but you don't know yourself, for every one you win, you're going to lose one. You're going to break even. And if you don't know your enemy and you don't know yourself, then you're going to lose every single battle. So knowing yourself is the biggest thing that 
the biggest secret to trading. I'm always saying there's no secrets. Well, that's the secret to trading. In fact, I always made money when I was sure I was right before I began. What beat me was not having the brains enough to stick to my own game. That is to play the market only when I was satisfied that precedence favored my play. So the reoccurring theme here is wait for that fat pitch, that so-called fat pitch. To a baseball player, the fat pitch is a hittable ball. You have to swing. You have to swing hard at the fat pitch. Some players say it's like time slows. It looks like a big cabbage ball coming at them, and they're in the zone, and everything just kind of lines up. You really have to wait for your pitch. Now, without going off on too far of a psychological tangent, that's hard for many people. And the reason is because, especially if you're successful, you didn't become successful by sitting around and waiting. And then as I talked with one psychiatrist who's a client, she explained to me why such motivated and educated people take such mediocre trades. And the reason is in your line of work, whether you're an automatic transmission mechanic or a psychiatrist or whatever, you take along whatever work comes along. You don't have the luxury of sitting around waiting. And, and she used the term train wreck, and that makes a lot of sense. In the markets, a lot different. You have to sit around and wait for that market to come to you. And another thing that I've, I know I've beaten a dead horse on, but it's the Jimmy Rogers quote that he just waits until his money lying in the corner and all he does is walk over and pick it up. In the meantime, he does nothing. Well, it's so interesting. When I'm in a losing trade, sometimes I'll go back and look at it and go, you know what? That was not a that's not a trade that I, I it was an okay trade, but maybe I shouldn't have taken that trade. Now we all go through that outcome bias, and you have to be careful of that. That's another presentation altogether. But when you're doing that post-mortem, as I'll beat the dead horse on in a few minutes, and that trade was kind of mediocre, you'll say, okay, well, maybe I should have taken that trade, or maybe that trade wasn't the greatest in the world. What's interesting is after you have been at this for a while, you'll see a setup and you'll actually get chills or get excited, your pulse will quicken, and it's almost like, and I've talked about this before, you'll have an out-of-body experience to where you just take the trade. And sometimes you don't even realize you took the trade until afterwards. I know it sounds crazy, but that's how good it looks. And a lot of times on those trades, you're going to make your most amount of money. And it's going to almost feel like taking candy from a baby. Now, of course, you do have to be careful, again, between intuition and intuition into wishing and intuition, but you will reach that point where it is intuition and you will make these trades where you just simply can't stand to be out of the market. But I think the true enlightenment comes where you would actually, for the most part, rather be out of the market than in. And that's kind of where I am now. Not that I have all the answers, but for the most part, I'm okay sitting on some cash. Now, eventually, I do feel a little pressure from that, truth be told. But I'm okay with being out of the market because nothing can hurt me while I'm out of the market. So embracing your own emotions while reading the emotions of others is key. You have to separate yourself from the market and you do that with a lot of introspection Roy Longstreet if you haven't read it I would urge you to read it go to books to read on my website davelander.com slash books dash to dash read and he wrote viewpoints of a commodity trade a great little one sitting read a lot of little philosophy in there. The deeper secret for the trader is his ability to, 
to subordinate his own will to the will of the market. Another one of those, what is, is. What happens, happens. I am a big fan of looking for original thought, especially if I'm doing a presentation. I want to give credit where credit is due. And a lot of times when I'm searching for that, I'll find, I'll find who said it 10 years ago, and then I'll find somebody that said it 50 years ago, then maybe somebody who said it 100 years ago. Along those lines, Livermore said there's nothing new under the sun, and that actually dates all the way back to the Bible. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. The psychology of the market will remain the psychology of the market. The psychology of the participants will remain the psychology of participants. And that's why I do believe that technical analysis will continue to work. But Dave, what if everybody uses technical analysis? Well, everybody's not going to use technical analysis because human nature will always be. You might have an aberration where things happen, but it's always going to come back to human nature. And I'll give you an example. Let's say that trading is going really well. My recommendation is doing really well. Well, what do people start doing? Well, they start getting in early. They start levering up. They stop honoring their stops because a lot of these things are taken off after they stop out. These normal psychological human behaviors come right back. Now, getting back to those original thoughts, another book I recommend you read, Psychology of the Stock Market by G.C. Selden. Uh, you might be able to find it free on the Internet because a lot of these old, old books are now in public domain. But I'll put it on books to read, too, if you want a paper copy from Amazon. For we all realize that the prices of stocks must, in the long run, be controlled by public opinion. What is he saying? You're trading traders, not stocks. As I spent some time in trading full circle, at least in those introductory videos to the course, I talked a lot about the difference between a company and a stock. And that's along the lines of Tom McClellan's reasoning, reasoning that you're forming a relationship between you and everyone who bought the stock prior to you, in addition to the company. But the more important thing is that you're trading traders and not markets. The point we fail to remember is that public opinion is in a speculative market is measured in dollars, not population. So obviously, it doesn't matter how everybody feels. It matters how they're voting with their dollars. Now, getting back to the introspection, few people are so introspective as to be able to tell where their where this bias in favor of their own interest begins and where it leaves off. Now, here's the clincher here. Still fewer bother to make the effort to tell. So you have to separate what you want to happen from what's actually happening. And... This game is really a game of introspection. If you're really looking, if you're really ready to look deep within yourself, then you have what it takes. If you are long or short the market, you are not an unprejudiced judge, and you will be greatly tempted to put such an interpretation upon current events as you coincide, as will coincide with your perceived opinion there are two things that are i often talk about interchangeably perceptual distortion and selective perception perceptual distortion distortion you distort what is actually there and it goes hand in hand for instance with selective perception for instance Let's say you're long a market, 
and it starts selling off. You might reason why it's selling off. And then let's say you have an uptick. Well, you're going to focus on that uptick and think, okay, well, that sell off is over with. Maybe everything's okay. And then let's say it sells off again and then has a little bit of uptick. You might just look at those upticks and think, oh, maybe it's coming back. Maybe it's coming back. And you fail to see what is. Now, I'm not a big fan of GAN. It's funny. I found a book in my office, a more modern text, which explains GAN. Brand new. I never even cracked it open. <laughs> I guess that was back in the day when I bought everything in the world I could find. Uh, my, my problem with GAN is he draws a thousand lines on a chart. And as somebody once said, if you draw enough lines on a chart, it's, it's always going to be at one of those lines. And it's always going to be a pattern. But I will tell you this, and, and I learned this from a trader who was in the GAN maybe a little too much, but he did tell me once, so he did see the light a little. He said, with GAN, don't focus so much on what he's trying to tell you directly, but kind of listen to what he's saying more indirectly. And GAN actually talks a lot about trading psychology. And he also has a list of rules that are actually pretty good as far as all of these Lines and everything, not a big fan of all that stuff. And I think it's controversial, but I think Mr. Gann ended up dying broke. So maybe Mr. Gann didn't understand Mr. Gann. I was speaking in, I was speaking in Russia a few years back, and some guy, I said, I don't get Gann. And some guy raised his hands like, you have an MBA, you have a degree in computer science. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you read my bio, thank you. How, do, how could you not get Gann? I was kind of stunned because I wasn't used to being heckled. And... I didn't have the comeback like, well, Mr. Gann died broke, so Mr. Gann didn't get Mr. Gann. Anyway, <laughs> you know me. I like to keep it simple. So I'm almost hesitant to quote somebody like Gann, but I will give Gann credit where credit is due. He has a lot of good things out there when it comes to trading psychology. The tape does not fool traders. Traders fool themselves. If you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. I've done presentations where I forget what year it was, 2012 or 2017 or somewhere in more recent times, there was this horrendous bear market in cocoa. And I asked you guys, how stressful was that market? And everybody's like, well, I don't, it wasn't stressful. So what? It went down. Well, so when it went down, because you weren't an active participant on the long side, had you been long that market, then it would have been a whole different situation. The tape does not fool traders. Traders fool themselves. When you are too close to anything, it wraps your judgment. A man cannot watch the tape and not be influenced by hope or fear. As I've said before, when you make a lot of observations. In other words, if you're watching that screen, more often than not, it's going to be a negative observation because markets spend a lot of time backing and filling. And those negative observations will wear you down or worse, they may suck you in to micromanage your trade. So that's why I often say walk away from your screens if there's nothing to do. Set an alert, or more accurately, we should call it an alarm, to alarm you when something needs to be done, if you have to be, if you have to. Now, you always get something good out of Livermore. If the unusual never happened, there would be no difference in people and then there wouldn't be any fun in life. The game would become merely a matter of addition and subtraction. It would make of us a race of bookkeepers with plotting minds. It's the guessing that develops a man's brain power. Just consider what you have to do to guess right. So, again, if the markets were perfect, they wouldn't be. So you have to embrace there's going to be some unknown there. Stepping into the unknown is very, very scary. People who don't 
actually you go to my website but know me personally it's like they ask me all these questions like I know all the answers I don't know all the answers I'm just a trend following moron as I often say but I know I can follow along if I find a trend and able to get and I'm able to get on that trend when does it end I don't know how long will this bull market last I don't know but I can tell you so far we're still in a longer term bull market Shorter term, a little bit more concern about the market. One day at a time. Somebody recently asked me what I thought about Mark Douglas. I think the world of Mark Douglas. The Disciplined Trader, another one of those books, came along just at the right time, along with Rotella's book. I would urge you to read it. If memory serves, it's been a while, but it's not quite as well written as some of his other books, but as far as content, it's phenomenal. And I would urge you to read it. Again, go to Books to Read for more on that. Mr. Douglas is no longer with us, unfortunately, so that's a bit of a bummer. I only sort of knew him briefly. We were supposed to work together on a project, and unfortunately it didn't pan out. A third party had put us together. So it's a bit of a bummer because I was really – Excited to meet him and talk with him and uh, work with him. Anyway, long story endless, the more we understand about the interacting forces behind our own behavior and the interactive, interacting environmental forces outside of us, the easier it is to fulfill our needs and achieve our goals. That's another one of those know your enemy, but more importantly, know yourself. Now, I don't know if everybody's like this, but when I get an epiphany, I just get so excited, and I'm such a nerd. An epiphany, I like this definition here from dictionary.com, a sudden intuitive perception or of or insight into the reality or essential meaning of something, usually initiated by something simple, homely, or commonplace occurrence or experience. When it comes to epiphanies, sometimes you can study really hard and you will get some epiphanies. For example, I'm studying a little bit of neuroscience or have been for a while. And when I finish Neuroscience for Dummies, I'm going to read Principles of Neuroscience, if I can make it through the book. <laughs> uh, as the author said in a TED Talk, I think the book weighs about two to three times what the human brain ways but in studying the neuroscience and this is one of those obvious type of epiphanies that you get from direct study is that we have this mclean's triune brain when you think of a brain you think of the thing that looks like a brain and not what's deep within that brain so what you see is the neo-mammalian complex, and that's what makes us us, the conscious thought. And then within that, you have the limbic system of the paleo-mammalian and the so-called lizard brain, reptile brain. Those two parts are involved with the autonomous functions of our body, and the limbic system is part of the paleo-mammalian brain. And Without showing you what little I know about neuroscience, I know enough to know that it's been proven that that's where your emotions arise, at least your snap decisions. And my epiphany there, after reading a little bit of Dr. Robert Marr, and that book was The Kaizen Way, the bottom line is you don't want to wake that panic monster. You want to tiptoe past that panic monster. And as I wrote and talked about, sometimes it's as simple as taking a few seconds or as Greg Morris used to say when he was in an airline situation or a fighter pilot situation where there was some sort of mechanical failure. The best thing to do was not immediately panic and wake that panic monster, but wind the clock. In other words, take a few seconds, wind the clock, let your brain catch up, let your 
your outer brain catch up at least to what's going on deep within that panicky part of your brain so you can make a logical, rational decision. Count to three before you make a trade. Take a deep breath. Count to three. I have a little airline clock here, as I've said before, and I I wind a clock before a trade, and that slows me down a little bit in case I'm firing off a day trade and when I shouldn't be or micromanaging or not ironing a stop or whatever the case may be before I go to make that move. I take a few seconds to think. And as I've said quite often, that also works in life. And as I said earlier, I try to see what happens in life. That also happens in trading. I try to embrace my emotions in life, which helps me to embrace my emotions in trading. And that little secret there is count to three the next time you find yourself having a snap back at your wife or significant other. And by the way, who am I to, to say, but you probably shouldn't have both. But anyway, all it takes is a few seconds to stop yourself from making that emotionally charged mistake. Another example of an epiphany for me is that I recently learned why it is so easy to plan the trade, but so difficult to follow the plan, and that's because information is static and unchanging when you're planning, and information changes once the market opens, and you're actually using two parts of your brain. Now, in working on this master trading psychology course that I've been working on forever, one of the books I read said take a personality test. So this was a bit of an epiphany for me. My agreeableness was very low. And it said, you are very low in agreeableness. Highly agreeable people tend to do whatever it takes to have positive relationships with other people. So I expect things to agree with me. So that's why, or at least another reason why it is so damn hard for me to follow a plan. Why? Because a lot of times, as it's been proven more often than not, usually a market is going to do the opposite of what you think it might do, even though longer term it might work out. I expect the market to agree with me. I scored a zero in modesty. It's kind of embarrassing that I would put that out. Modest people don't like to brag or show off because those types of behaviors can be harmful to relationships. Well, I scored very low in modesty, a zero. So these very low readings are probably not good for trading. This means I'm not really go with the flow. So I have to work at that. Now, I kind of backed in by accident to the work of Gary Klein, which I found through Montier, and that was along the lines of what I just said, that information stress is, I think I just said, stress increases when information is changing or uncertain. And I just found this book by Gary Klein. I'm reading it thinking like, boy, this is, this is almost, this reads like a Malcolm Gladwell book. I love Malcolm Gladwell. He's my favorite author. I love his books. And I just noticed as I'm putting together this presentation that Malcolm Gladwell actually endorsed this book, which I think is kind of interesting. I'm just a little bit into the book so far, but the point I was making today or would maybe put these slides in is that study hard and sometimes you will get epiphanies through studying hard, such as the McLean's Triune Brain learning about the neuroscience and how the amygdala and that limbic system works and can cause you to make these emotionally charged decisions. But don't always expect that to give you these great revelations. Those will come a lot of times in the shower. 
once you get all this information in your head, you'll wake up with them or you'll take a shower or you get away from the office and then that's when you'll have your epiphanies. I like to go for a walk every now and then. Sometimes while I'm out on a walk is when I'll have epiphanies, not when I'm sitting here staring at a screen. Now, while working on the master psychology course, I was thinking, okay, how can I help everyone? And I'll talk about that in just one second. And that's that's kind of a lofty goal, but I think I can. And the one thing that if you walk away with from all this is if you can learn to resist the urges now and then later identify the source. I have always been emotional in life and I am very emotional in trading. I work out of a little guest house, which is separated from the main house. We're in a process of down process of downsizing. I'm not sure what's gonna happen when we work in one house because my wife is going to find out that I can use a certain word as a noun, an adjective, an adverb, a gerund. <laughs> so it's going to be quite interesting. But as I've gotten deeper and deeper into the psychology, I've learned like, oh, well, there's a reason why I'm emotional, because you can't make any decisions without emotions. All right, well, that makes sense. There's a reason why I did this stupid thing just out of the blue, just a stupid thing. I planned my trade. I took my time. I did my analysis. And the market opens, does something I don't want it to do. And I'm, I just jump in and do something stupid. Well, there's a reason for that. Because I let that little brain control the big brain. So... What I would tell you is before you understand all of this neuroscience and all of this trading psychology, just do the right thing, even if it's hard, and then later figure out why it's so hard to do the right thing. As I often tell people, just follow the plan on one trade, on one trade. And don't get caught up in an outcome bias. If you lose on a trade, it doesn't necessarily mean that you made a bad decision. Now, if you lose over and over and over again, then, yeah, maybe you need to write. Uh, sorry. If you lose over and over again, maybe you need to come back and look at what you're doing and make sure you're doing the right thing. But do the hard thing even though you don't understand why it's so hard to do it, and later the reasons may be revealed to you, the whys, and I thought it would be kind of fun to do a little play on words, the whys may come later. Eventually you will know why you're doing these things, and that makes it easier. The trader must work out his own salvation and should blame himself and no one else for his losses, for unless he does, he will never be able to correct his weakness. Again, heavy is the head that wears a crown, you and only you. It's great having the freedom to do this, but with that comes a cost. And you have to be willing to do the introspection and make sure you're doing the right thing and not making these emotionally charged decisions. So when I started working on this master psychology course, I did get a little stressed out thinking like, how can I help the masses? How can I help everyone? And one of the things that sort of was in the back of my mind was years ago, I knew a trader and he always seemed to have the answer for everything. And he was helping someone else. And within 20 or 30 minutes, he wasn't a psychologist or a psychiatrist. He says, oh, yeah, we solved his problem because his father was channeling him from his grave. So we just moved on. So the question is, is your father channeling you from your grave? I don't know. Maybe you'll find that out down the line. And I doubt that 
that in this 30 minute session, these people talk, this trade of talk with this person. I doubt seriously that was the problem or the only problem. So again, your, your whys will come later. Now, we have a shared physiology. We all have the same brain for the most part, right? Or we all have the same brain, right? Some of us are a little more emotional than others, but the physiology is the same. And we also, believe it or not, for the most part, share a shared psychology. We share the same psychology. So just a few things here. Have you ever traded for action? Have you ever cut your profit short? Let's say you make a little, lose it all, and get stopped out. Make a little, lose it all, get stopped out. Make a little, lose it all. Well, third or fourth time of doing that, screw this. I'm taking that money. Can't go broke, take it a profit. Wrong. That's how many people do go broke. They never allow for a big winner to materialize to pay for all these losses. You trade in less than ideal conditions. Again, hard for the more successful and motivated to sit on their hands. Do you not plan your trade? I know a lot of people who just wing it and they do very poorly. They will read about something in a book and then try to trade it 10 minutes later. Not following the plan. That's a biggie. Somebody emailed me recently from a good standpoint and said, this is my plan, Dave. I'm going to follow it come hella high water. I would encourage you to email me that. Give me a setup. Email me that, hey, Dave, I'm going to get in here, put a stop here, and I'm going to follow this plan come hella high water. And he's doing quite well by doing that. You ever exit the first signs of adversity? I see it all the time. I have an unfair advantage because I get to see mistakes all day long, and it's a constant reminder, hey, Dave, don't do that. But I'll see people get into a position, wait a day or two, well, Dave, the market went up, and it didn't go up, so I got out. Something's wrong. And then a few days later, stock takes off. In some cases, not all the time, obviously, but in some cases, stocks have even been bought out. Have you ever watched a trade that you should have taken take off without you? That happens. I'm not talking about just missing a trade. Like you say, oh, that looks pretty good. And then the next day you see it take off. I'm talking about I'm going to get in X, Y, Z at 10. And then the next day it triggers. And then it immediately starts coming back in. It's like, oh, I'm glad I didn't get in that. Now it's 950. I would have lost 50 cents in that trade. And then by the end of the day, let's say it's down a point. Oh, sure to dodge that bullet. Well, the following day, stock takes off without you. You ever take a mediocre setup? Yes. You ever hold on to a losing trade way past your stop? I know I've said this ad nauseum, but I get emails all the time. Dave, that stinky you recommended, I'm down 50%. What should I do? Go back and forth. I didn't recommend it. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. When? Give me the date. Oh, yeah, I did. Well, it stopped out six months ago. Micromanaging. How many lessons have I done on that? That's the biggest sin of say, of trading out there, other than obviously micro uh, money management problems. And again, we have a shared physiology. Now, while you're waiting on the Ys, W H Y S or W I S E few things. Don't be doomed from the start. This is the first thing you have to do. Regardless of how many books you read, regardless of whether you take Big Dave's courses or come to Big Dave's webinars, you have to not be doomed from the start. 
you need to be adequately capitalized. You have to have enough money to where you can trade and take a small amount of that and put at risk on each individual trade, and that's not going to stress you out. Trading cannot affect your lifestyle, or you're going to have much, much bigger problems. You can't trade with the rent money. Now, if you don't have enough money to trade, all is not loss. Use what little money you have to get educated. You're going to spend far less money getting educated than you would putting that hard-earned money into the markets. I can all but guarantee that. You're going to need the support of others. And if you don't have the support of others, as I say, are you willing to lay out a careful plan and explain to them what you are doing? Or are you willing to be accountable to them because they don't have your support? Or are you willing to do whatever it takes to win their support? Or are you physically able to trade the methodology? I talked about a doctor who was day trading, carrying a laptop from exam room to exam room. He had no business day trading. and He since solved those problems by no longer day trading. He now has to call in a broker to make an order. He went back to a voice broker. And to quote him, he does not want to look like a lunatic calling them all day long. So he makes sure he really likes to trade before he takes a trade. Now, one of the easiest things you can do is let the market make decisions for you. This is a whole presentation in and of itself, but it might be as simple as let a stock open. Let's say you're getting in at 10, it opens at 950. Put in a buy stop. At 10, go to the gym, take your wife somewhere, take your girlfriend somewhere, but don't take them to the same place. <laughs> let the markets make decisions for you. Well, let's say the stock is not near your stop. Put in a hard stop and go about your life. As I've said quite often, I'm not a huge fan of limit orders. But there may be cases where you might want to put in what I call a pay me order. Let's say you're in a stock and you don't want to watch a screen. I don't care to. I would recommend you don't. Obviously, you just set alarms. But let's say you don't even want to bother with alarms. Well, you can put in a limit order in case that stock spikes up. That's what I call pay me. You can get paid. Let's say if you're following my hybrid approach to money management, exit half at that level. So there's a lot of things that you can do to let the market make decisions for you. The more decisions you have the market make for you, the better your life will become. In my Forex trading, I have a platform that allows for automated trailing stops. And all I have to do is occasionally tweak it a little bit to loosen them up. But while I'm sleeping, if that currency drops and I'm sure that trailing stops going to follow it down. Now I ran into a few issues early on where I wasn't loose enough with that, but I worked through that. The point is have something automated, not mechanical, but automated to take care of making those decisions for you. You physically will have to put the stop in. You physically might have to put that limit order in to take those partial profits. And then occasionally you physically might have to adjust a stop. And as long as that market is far enough away from that protective stop or protective trailing stop, then just leave it in place. Let the market take you out. Let the market keep you in. There's been many of times I wanted to get out of the market because it's going against me. I want to micromanage, get out. It's like, you know what, Dave? Put in a hard stop, turn off your screens, go for a walk. And not all the time, but many times, the market will turn around and go straight back up. And obviously I'm long. And that's a good thing. And sometimes it gets stopped out. Well, learning to live with that decision is another conversation in and of itself. But if I get stopped out, I get stopped out. So what? 
I know. You're not next to me while I'm screaming F-bombs. And again, beating a dead horse here, recognize the difference between intuition and intuition. The more motivated you are, the more successful you are, the harder it's going to be for you to not to try to make something happen. There's nothing to do. I was fortunate enough many, 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 many years ago, I think in the mid-90s, 1994 maybe, 1995, I had a voice futures broker who, when I had a bit of a drawdown, he said, just play the game. And, and his game was like, make the money, make the numbers get bigger. Well, now my game is, how long can I ride this trend? How long can I stay in this trend without giving up too much of it? Now, there's a balancing act, but by loosening my stop, I'm able to stay sometimes, not all the time, sometimes days, weeks, and even longer. And sometimes even on, let's say, an hourly chart in Forex, which I like to trade off of, offer major highs and lows. And the reason I'm trading hourly is because those markets are more efficient and I'm looking to capture that inefficient move. But in doing that, even off an hourly chart, sometimes I can stay with the position for a long, long time. So make it a game. Make it fun. And one way to do that is to trade at a size that's almost meaningless if you're not disciplined and keep doing that. Get those repetitions in. Follow that plan. Follow that plan. Trade your plan. Follow the plan. Okay. Plan your, I'm sorry. Plan your trade. Trade your plan. Plan your trade. Trade your plan. Rinse and repeat. Keep doing that until it becomes second nature. So the process is simple. We talked about the process of trading. We had some lessons on that. Follow that process. Find your methodology. Get comfortable with your methodology. Do your analysis until you feel like you really have something. Plan that trade and then trade that plan. I know it's all easier said than done. I don't want to make it sound like it's an easy peasy. Okay. It's not. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of discipline. But you can develop that discipline by getting the reps in and just doing it. So, I said play trade, <laughs> plan the trade, trade to plan. And here's the biggie. Do the post-mortem. Do the post-mortem. After the dust settles, go in and look and say, was this setup the greatest setup since sliced bread? And if you say yes, then by all means, win, lose, or draw, you did the right thing. All right, Chief Orman really wound up today. <laughs> Biggest challenge I have is trying to recover from portfolio losses and it clouds my judgment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. When you get into a hole, you're, you're focused on climbing out of that hole. And a market doesn't care about your time frame. It might take you a few weeks to get out of the hole, a few months to get out of the hole, or a year to get out of that hole. If your kids need money for college or they're hungry, then it's going to be hard if that's the money you use to feed your family or educate your family or pay your rent. It's going to be hard to not feel that pressure. Well, the market doesn't care about your time frame. Jesse Livermore, again, once you start quoting him, you can't stop. But he said, don't give me timing, give me time. If you take this silly little trend-following methodology and give yourself enough times, oh, what does Big Dave say? Well, the market's going sideways here. Maybe I should sit on my hands or be very selective. Maybe take a look at a commodity stock or something more speculative like an IPO while I'm waiting for this market to get its act together. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait. Recently on a trading service, I don't, I can't remember the, the, the last position that triggered. It's been a long time. There's been a few setups we put out there, they don't trigger, or haven't triggered, I should say. So what do we do? Nothing, just keep chipping away at it. Keep chipping away at it. And don't give up. As I've said before, somebody emailed me and said, Dave, 
I'm going to quit the trading service. Not the trading service be all end all. I'm just talking about following any methodology. But he says, Dave, I'm done for a while. I'm, I'm going to come back, but I'm done for now because I don't see any setups in the foreseeable future. And neither did I. And an hour or two later, I'm doing my analysis. I found two setups like, well, these look pretty damn good. I feel like these are worth taking. So I put them on, recommended them. And they turned out to be the two biggest winners or two of the biggest winners of the entire year. And without those two big winners, the performance would have been a little bit more mediocre. So you have to keep chipping away at it. Don't give me timing. Give me time. Another nice webinar. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome, Steve. Rotella's book is a novel. It's pretty thick. It's a doorstop. All right. Any thoughts or questions, comments, amusing anecdotes, or anything else, or anything we've covered so far? A couple announcements. A lot of the things I talk about in here, a lot of those uh, little minor epiphanies, such as your trading traders, not markets, you form a relationship with the company, but you're also forming a relationship with everyone who bought that prior to you, the difference between a company and a stock. That's all in the first four videos of Trading Full Circle. That'll go a long ways to getting your mindset properly for the market. So read those. I'm sorry, watch those. Just put your information in and you'll get those. Um, I'm such a nerd. I've been busting my ass on this LMS rollout. And it's pretty cool. LMS is learning management system. As I've said quite often lately, uh, I guess a peer, someone in marketing once said, you have a lot of a ton of great content. Why do you hide it? And I'm working to bring that to light. And it's going to be a nominal cost for all this, but I think you'll see that it's going to be well worth it. And if you come in here to, this is what it's going to look like. And we'll be able to track progress on everything. And now instead of answering all these emails and then wondering whether people get it or not. It's like, okay, go through the money management course and you'll see how to set a protective stop, how to trail a stop, what percentage to risk on a trade. Go through the mindset series and you'll hear a lot of the things we talk about here in the week of charts. And eventually I'm going to figure out a way to have all this index. So, I can know what is where and we can answer all these questions through this. And if we don't, there'll be, we'll have a webinar and talk about it. We'll have a Facebook group. So anyway, I'm a nerd, but I'm pretty excited about all this. I think it's going to be fantastic. All right. Can you go back to the previous slide? Uh, which one, Nancy? The, you want, you want this Earl? All right, just let me know if that's it, the one eyes, the one eyes. That one? If you want my slide, if you want these slides, I'll, I'll email them to you if you want. One eyes. I'm not sure what that, what you mean, but I'll be happy to email you these if you like. Okay, you guys want to talk about individual stocks? Boy, Chief Orman really wound up. Sorry, it took I hope it didn't go too long. Let's take a few minutes to go through your stocks. LGCY. Well, before we do that, let's take a look at the overall market before we forget. Just a couple things. This won't take long. Nothing that I haven't been saying quite a bit lately. Right now, we have a net-net problem. We have a big blue arrow problem. The big blue arrow, let's go back to February, is pointed sideways. And, yeah, we've worked our way higher lately. But follow through will be key. And we have a little resistance to overcome. The good news is if we add in a moving average. Yeah, Donald, that Billy trade is the trade I was talking about that somebody said they're going to follow their plan come hell or high water. And that's pretty cool. As I've been saying quite a bit, if you take a look at a 50 week Moving average on a weekly S&P, we haven't had any daylight, or we, we've had daylight, I should say, all the way going way back to 2016. 
meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. We had this one little kiss right there. And so far, the market has taken off again. So if someone says, Dave, where are we? I'll say, well, we're still in a longer term bull market. Dave, you recommended some shorts lately. Well, the market looked like it was rolling over. You got to get ahead of it, especially when you see daily signals like back here, a little first thrust, bow tie, et cetera, happening. But lately, things have been improving. However, the big blue arrow so far is pointing sideways, at least on the daily chart. Now, NASDAQ composite, this scores as a bit of a bummer a couple of days ago. We broke out to multi month highs. Gap down, and now we're trying to work our way back. So, so far, so good. If we close where we are right now, we will close at multi-month highs. That's a good thing, right? For me to get excited about the market, it's going to have to make new highs and stay there. When the market made new highs not long ago, I'm like, yeah, it's making new highs. But will it stick? It has to make new highs and stay there. I want it to start looking like this again, okay? where you can start drawing that obvious arrow in the direction of the trend. Now, this is what has me most encouraged, although the S&P 500 and NASDAQ are mostly sideways. Take a look at this Russell 2000. We had a top here, a top here, a potential top here, and so far we've taken that top out. Now, follow through will be key. If this comes right back in, then this will be the mother of all fake outs. And you got to be careful. That market will trick you. It'll say, hey, look, Dave or Joe or Billy, I'm breaking out. You better jump on. I'm like, okay, well, not so fast, Beavis. Show me. So let it prove itself by continuing to break out. But, hey, so far, so good. That looks fantastic. Now, no need to go through a whole lot of sectors. Most are pretty choppy. There's some areas that still look a little questionable, like the fence. And then the foods are kind of dubious in here. You can see just kind of bouncing around these old lows. Banks sideways at best. So just go through the major, what I call the major mix, and you'll see most are sideways and choppy. So it's, let's not start kissing each other just yet. But some areas like the energy is beginning to take off in here and looking pretty good. And what I like about this is that energies can trade contra or in lieu of the indices, which makes it great. Okay. Okay, LGCY. Well, if you are if you are a trend follower, then obviously this market is what? In a trend, okay? And it's an accelerating trend. Now it's getting a little crazy in here with today's outside bar down. But if this thing pulls back and does a TKO off of this, okay? then I think it might be worth a shot. I would definitely put that on my watch list. Why do you like IWM versus NYSC to get a feel for the overall market? Well, I like the IWM because it's smaller cap issues, and I tend to trade smaller cap issues unless I'm shorting, and then I tend to short bigger cap issues as a general statement. I believe in trading inefficient markets. But Dave, you said you trade Forex. Yes, but I look for an inefficient move in efficient markets. Same reason I short efficient markets sometimes, such as thick big cap stocks. On the long side, in general, you want to be, we just so happen to have the stock up, LGCY, somebody just asked about it, HVF70. This thing has tripled or quadrupled over a fairly short period of time. That move was not priced in. So you want to find something that's going to make inefficient moves. John's asking about GE. GE is not an inefficient stock. Although sometimes efficient stocks like GE can, and can be in a keyword, and that sentence makes some inefficient moves. So it looks like it's trying to bottom out in here. I would say this stock has bottomed. The only problem is it's going to have a little trouble getting through this overhead supply. As a general statement, it's hard for me to get excited about GE, but who knows? Okay, if it sets up, I might be willing to go after it. HPR, I'm currently long in that particular stock, FYI. It's an IPO, just a full disclosure on that. 
that's the best looking stock I've ever seen in my life. Oh my gosh. Yes, I would I would mortgage your house. I would I would take your college kids college education fund and uh, put it all in this stock. Just buy as much as you can. Absolutely. Fantastic. No, of course I'm joking. <laughs> no, it looks pretty good. I, I don't want to be biased. I mean, as uh, was it Longstreet said earlier or Selden, it's kind of hard to have a position and not have a bias. And you have to learn to separate those and look at it from an antiseptic standpoint. But yes, I think it still looks pretty good. In IPOs, I like that first retracement and the take look, when you let's do this real quick. If you just sort of connect the dots in here, okay, and as I've said before, when in doubt, take the chart out. So if we made the bars black, reminds me of the joke in the airplane. I guess, you know, all these movies that are so funny, I guess you couldn't, uh, Mel Brooks said he couldn't remake Blazing Saddles in this day and age. Everybody's so sensitive. But see, you've got a thrust higher, obviously, in a, in a deep pullback. And that's what I call a first deep retracement. It's also a pullback. You just want to call it that. So, yeah, I think it looks good. I really do, even though I am long. So, obviously, don't please don't jeopardize Junior's education. Seems like a climatic top went up 1 to 5, then doubled, way extended from 20 SMA. Uh, you talk about that LGCY. Which stock are you talking about? Yeah, here's the thing, though. When you have these parabolic moves, sometimes you can get on board with something like a TKO. But, yeah, I would. That is a caveat. It is a little extreme in here. And be very cautious if you go after something like that. I agree. Hilarious contradiction. You also say you love efficient stocks when shorting. Well, I love efficient stocks with shorting because what could happen is everybody tends to cancel each other out. So we're short PHM, which is a very thick and efficient stock, okay? But it can make an inefficient move. Go back to 2016 and look at the service archives and we're short a bunch of banks, a bunch of stodgy old banks. And we did okay in them because... By being efficient, everything's kind of priced in. Traders tend to cancel each other out. But when they begin to sell off, you have a disequilibrium in price. So it's not a contradiction. It's that efficient markets can make inefficient moves. If you read Go Go No Mo, which is a silly name. In other words, what I'm saying is the Go Go stock, the momentum stock is no more. And they begin to roll over you could actually do quite well shorting these more efficient markets. So hopefully that made sense and I didn't trip, trip up my words. IQ, I've been watching. This is an IPO. It kind of had a hard time getting started. I think it looks okay. It's not jumping out at me as, as something that I have to have. But two things. One, when IPOs are nearing brand new highs or closing at brand new highs, as a general statement, they tend to be a good buy because everybody who owns it is happy and they don't have a long, long, long memory. You're not pushing up into overhead supply. Not enough time to go into all the details of IPOs, but as a general statement, it's a good idea to buy IPOs or look to buy IPOs when they're not far away from their all-time highs. Okay. I'm getting asked about some of the Landry list. Let me just see what's going on here real quick. Oh, never mind. Okay, WPX. Yeah, this looks pretty good. A couple of caveats. I don't like this drift here, but it did kind of get its act together. It's okay. I would prefer to have accelerated a little higher. Put this on your watch list. And if it, if it continues higher, then maybe try to pull back along the way. Okay. So good eye on that. But put that on your watch list. Not set up right now. Somebody said amen. I forget what I was talking about. 
Yeah, Billy, that's the one we're talking about. Um, a recent IPO trade I entered on Monday, working well for me so far with partial profits taken this morning. Good job, Donald. Yeah, and what was I just saying? Sometimes with IPOs, when they're making new highs, you want to buy. Okay. Also, just for S&Gs, let's put in the little five-day SMA system. We got good numbers today in spite of all the glitches. Yeah, so this would have been a buy based on this breakout here, a brand new closing high, and then a gap above the moving average. I'll have that lesson put on the back end of the website under methodology. How do you feel about real estate stocks starting to set up? Eh, I'm not a big fan of the REITs. I saw one or two that look kind of interesting. The REITs are going to tend to be lower in volatility, more efficient. We were just talking about efficiency versus inefficiency. So I'm just not that excited about it. Um, I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but it's kind of interesting that bonds are down here at brand new lows, multi-year lows, which is a little concerning. And REITs are doing okay. Selected REITs are doing okay. So will the... I don't know if the ta tail wag of the dog, dog or dog wag the tail is a correct analogy, but will, at the least, it seems like this will put a little pressure on those REITs. Energy is driving me crazy. Hard to get in them outside of IPOs. Well, that's okay. You'll, you know, if they stay, that sounds like an emotional response, and I hear you. We all have emotional responses. But if they continue to trend, then we'll be able to get in on pullbacks. SDRL, that sounds like an energy. CDRL, maybe? Yeah, I mean, this is obviously speculative because look at the HV is 169. It's super low priced. You know, it's going to have some problems along the way. Maybe on pullbacks, but it's just so crazy. I mean, if you, you, could, you could buy it right now, just use a 65 cent stop, okay? I'm, I'm kind of joking there. Okay, TA. Okay, TA. Okay, TA. Yeah, put this on your watch list. Not currently set up, but trending nicely. Needs a little bit more pullback. NVIDIA, short if price falls below 240. Let's take a look at that. No, not necessarily. Um, but this is what I would consider probably a go go no mo in the works. Uh, I guess Bitcoin is what put this thing up here. They found out that a graphic processor a long time ago works a lot better than a CPU for making Bitcoin calculations, for mining Bitcoins. Um, it, to me, it looks like you'd have to take out 210 for this to be a viable setup. Setups are clean and energy aren't clean. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's going to be typical. That's one problem. Good eye uh, on that. Logged in as friend. Good luck. I mean, good uh, good eye on that. What you you might find is commodity related areas because they're based on an efficient market can sometimes be choppy. So. And if you look at the USO, you can see it's kind of chopping along in here. But in general, working its way higher. So I tend to be a little bit more lenient. Yeah, I'm seeing a few real estate stocks setting up too. Is that part of the – let's take a look at the, at the area. Is that just an aberration? Because I agree with you. I'm seeing a few real estate stocks, but let's take a look at the sector. See, the sector still looks pretty dubious to me. Just kind of do that big picture analysis. You had a thrust down and so forth. It's just got to retrace back up. And then you have a mountain of overhead supply to overcome. So I agree with you in that I saw a few setups, but it's kind of hard for me to get excited about it. 
Not that I always do intermarket analysis, but you can't ignore the fact that rates are headed higher for now. And that there's overhead supply. So it would have to be one charming REIT. Was that would be one charming pig? Question is H U Y A. Um, yeah, I mean this might this is worth putting on your watch list. You could have a new a new closing high type of trade in here or a buy uh, with that five day moving average pattern. So yeah, put that on your watch list for sure. T Zoo. Uh, this has had quite the run, so maybe on a serious, serious TKO. It's also kind of thin now. It used to not be so thin. So it's be careful due to how thin it is, And but it's had a good run. So a serious knockout move, and I'm talking maybe three or four points at least, something that will look like that, something to scare the bejesus out of everybody, okay? Yeah, EL is on my was a, a short for us for quite a while, but we actually took it off the list last night simply because it just kept going higher and higher. But this is an example of an e a efficient stock. Look at the volume, tons and tons of volume. What's that? One, two, three, 19 million a day, and it's beginning to crack from high levels. So we actually were looking to short this one for several days. We took it off the list. So good eye on that. Altor, ALTR and pulls back, probably. Uh, yeah, but it hasn't really broken out that much just yet. So I hear you. So, yeah, if it looks like this and then like that, maybe like that. If it, well, let me draw it. You know, once it gets a little further higher, a little higher up. But, yeah, put that on your watch list. But in the meantime, momentumless, I should say, in the meantime, keep looking for other setups. E-O-L-S. We're going to have to wrap it up. We are way late today. Finally got started. And then, yeah, this one's kind of crazy. Um, I hear you, though. If you're just looking at this leg here, the pullback, HV of 127. Yeah, super, super duper risky trade, but I hear you. Um, be super careful in that. But, yeah, I like it. I do. It's it's um even though it did pull back below this base, you got to realize that I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to IPOs. So in this particular case, I think this one still has potential, even though it cleared the base and came back to below the base. I think it still looks pretty good. So good show. You're welcome. RSPP. Let me just take care of this last one. Uh, this looks a little wide and loose to me. And just kind of draw your lines in here, and you can see that it really hasn't gone anywhere in quite a while. Okay, so you've got one month at least of sideways trading. So it was kind of off to the races here. It pulled back off to the races and now kind of sideways. So I would look at energy and see if there's anything else that looks a little bit better. There's one I can't show you right now because it's on the um, – list for today but there are better ones out there trust me go through the sector though as i say sometimes one stock can lead you a mediocre stock can lead you to a great stock within the sector all right i'm going to wrap things up sometimes these recordings are hard to process once they get too long i love doing these shows thanks for your uh, sticking with me doing the glitch earlier as you can tell i love doing these shows it's the highlight of my week any answer, unanswered questions he tried to say david dave lander.com everybody have a fantastic weekend if we'll talk between now and then and hopefully i'll see all you guys and girls again next week thank you so much